Good evening. I'm David Hales. I have the wonderful honor and deep pleasure of being president at College of the Atlantic. And I would like to welcome you here tonight for a very special evening. Um, if I may as well, I'd like to uh, welcome the uh, radio audience of Speaking in Maine, who will be hearing this presentation as it is rebroadcast, David. And uh, uh, we certainly welcome their interest in this program as well. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Casey Mallincrott, who is the president of the Champlain Society, to welcome you on behalf of the Champlain Society. Thank you, David. <laughs> It's always such a tremendous pleasure and privilege when I have an opportunity to, to represent the college and thank those of you who've played such an important role in allowing the college to be the wonderful and, and really quite extraordinary organization that it is. Um, as everyone knows who is involved with a, 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 an organization that moves from the heart, there is always a need for the support that pays the salaries of our marvelous faculty and keeps the library open. and. Uh, allows the practical day-to-day -day things to go on. And for those of you who contribute to the well-being of the college, you really allow it to happen on a very basic level, as well as supporting the wonderful education that these marvelous students get and that our faculty provide. I hope you'll take a moment, if you're not uh, familiar with the college, new to the college, to walk around our campus and look at our new green housing and uh, see this beautiful environment in which our students uh, move ahead in exploring the world, and we're gonna hear more about exploring right now from our wonderful trustee, David Hackett Fisher, but David is gonna do that introduction. So thank you so much for your generosity to the college, and welcome. The storytellers of every generation are precious. And David Hackett Fisher is one of the great storytellers of our generation. Whether he takes on the broad patterns of history as in Albion Seed or the Great Wave, or the narrative of crucial moments and great characters, his work shows us that deep and committed scholarship and passion, excitement, meaning, and purpose go hand in hand that indeed they are mutually enriching. His work moves far beyond the what and when and how of our history to the core of wisdom, understanding why. To understand the value of the study of history, one need only read the works of David Fisher. He offers us the opportunity to purposefully travel in time, but his works are round trip tickets. They do not leave us stranded in then, but they return us to now. And if we are apt students, we will return wiser than when we began the journey. Inherent in understanding how those who have, in, in understanding how those who have preceded us saw the world and understanding why they acted as they did is insight into how we see our world and why we do what we do. We have in our future, our, our very near future, another trip with David Fisher, this time to the world of Samuel Champlain, and we are privileged to have him tonight as a personal guide. Please join me in welcoming the historian, university professor and Warren professor of history at Brandeis University and trustee of College of the Atlantic, David Hackett Fisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Thank David. You, it's sir. a pleasure to be here. No, I can't wait to hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I, let me, do I have two echoes? I have two uh, mics here, I think. I, I'm going to stand away from the podium, and uh, I, I wonder if I'm audible in the back. Good. Uh, let me begin. Um, I remember uh, Ronald Reagan once began, he said, uh, before I give my speech tonight, I'd really like to say something. <laughs> and um, I, I would uh, like to say something about the College of the Atlantic. Uh, we have watched the college grow from a distance and then 
close up. And I think of my, uh, the, the faculty here as my colleagues, the trustees as my friends, and the students are just as wonderful as students are everywhere else. And this college has struggled, as so many colleges have done. Most small colleges that were founded in this republic uh, failed. Uh, this college uh, survived. And now it's flourishing. And there's a sense of momentum about it as well, uh, which makes it just wonderful to see. It's already having an impact on the life of the, of the island and a long reach uh, through the world. That's a great uh, honor to be associated with it. And thanks to many of you for your support. Now, what I want to do tonight is to talk about a project that's just about done. And like most of my projects, it begins not in the way that other things begin in economics or the social sciences or other disciplines. It doesn't begin with a model or a theory uh, or a paradigm. It usually begins with some sort of anomaly, a question, a problem. And this project began here on this island with anomalies, puzzles that I saw around me. I think the first was when I started coming up here uh, with my wife in the 1960s. Uh, and we were driving along Route 3, heading for Bar Harbor, and we got through Hull's Cove. And I looked off to the right, and there is that wonderful place called Cover Farm that you may know. And it looked to a historian's eye a very odd place indeed. It's a long open meadow that runs back from the water's edge at right angles to the shore. And then at the top of the meadow is a very old house. And that's a peculiar form of land use that's very rare in New England, but it's very common in New France. It's called that riparian system of land distribution. And you'll see it along the Ile d'Orléans, just, just east of Quebec, or up and down the, 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 the banks, uh, with house after house set in just that way. And to a historian, it was an anomaly. The question was, how did it get here uh, as it was out of place? I'm always fascinated. I love when I fly always to get a window seat and from 35,000 feet to look down at the land as it, as, it, uh, as it passes beneath. And one can see, for example, as to cross Ohio, across the Scioto River, and on one bank of the river is the area that the New England settlers came into, and everything's ge a, 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 a geometric survey pattern. On the other side, it was the Virginia Military District. And it was the, it's like a crazy quilt, all those meets and bounds and that sort of thing. And then one sees this riparian system in the St. Lawrence Valley, the Richelieu River, and here on this island in Hull's Cove. And I wondered, why? How did it get there? And it's a story that takes us to the extraordinary career of Madame de Grégoire, who uh, was the granddaughter of the Sierra de Cadillac, self-styled a Gascon adventurer who uh, was able to get a, a, a seigneurial grant from New France here, and then his granddaughter persuaded the, the general court of Massachusetts to, uh, to accept her, uh, her title to it. And now, as a consequence, she claimed most of the eastern part of this island, our deeds, anyone who owns a piece of property on this side of the island, has a deed when the title search goes back to a bourbon king of France, one of the few places. That's another anomaly. Uh, for, this, uh, for, this, uh, for this island. And then the various other things that popped up, the names on the land. Uh, some of these French names were inventions in the 20th century, but many of them go far back in time. Uh, and they're the islands uh, of, of, as, such as this island and Ile Haute and uh, Grand Manon and many others along the coast. And they are very striking uh, uh, to me. And then as I searched through those anomalies, another set of puzzles began to appear when I got inside of them. One was to observe that there was a, not only a French presence in this part of New England, but there was also a, uh, 
a, a, a very a, a, a close and sustained connection between the French and the Indian nations who lived here. And one example would be the, um, uh, the, the example of the, of, the, of the trading of connections that, that, that forms. On this campus, every summer, uh, we have Indians who come together uh, and who have festivals, dances, celebrations, and a lot of trading uh, goes on between the Indians and uh, uh, the people of, of European uh, descent. Uh, and I talked to some of the people who were running that, and I said, how long has this been going on? And they said, none of us can remember when it began. And then I searched into the works of Champlain and Les Carbeaux and began to find references to exactly that sort of thing going on here, beginning in July 1608 on this island, uh, when uh, a, a French a captain named Champ Doré was sent here to meet an Indian leader named Astaku, whose name you all know well. Uh, and that was a process that began. And then it was in some of those places that have those French names, Castine, for example. And there we see another intimate connection between the French and the Indians uh, in a very special way, different from much of New England. Castine takes its name from the Baron of Castine, who came with his military unit, stayed, married a, the daughter of a Abnaki uh, a Sachem. And she was described as a woman of surpassing beauty, a grace, and accomplishments, uh, outshining the women of the court of France. And what was interesting about that union was not only that it endured, but it produced many children and grandchildren. And some of them married into Indian families, and others married into aristocratic families in France. And one sees that play back and forth. Uh, of Indians and uh, uh, French joining together. And then as I searched through those puzzles, something else happened. As I read into each one of those stories, one name kept coming up again and again, and it was this one, Champlain. It was uh, Champlain who was the person who founded the first senior seniorial system in New France in 1623, uh, from which the one at Hull's Cove is descended. It was Champlain and with the Sieur de Mont who sent uh, Champ Doré to meet with Astacou and start that trading. It was Champlain who talked to the Huron in council and he said to them in 1634 that he had a purpose and a dream. He said, my dream is that our children will marry your children and we will be one people, Champlain, on the design of, of all of that. Uh, and so uh, that leads to my business uh, for tonight. Who was this man? What did he do? What was driving him? What difference did he make? And why should we care? So let's first of all have a look. Notice this script, by the way. This is his signature. Notice that it's a cursive hand. It's a hand that might, it's a, it's a name that might have been written a few moments ago. Very different from the secretary hand that is the despair of historians in, with old documents. Uh, the, with, uh, the letters are all disconnected. Uh, the letter W in some cursive scripts requires six strokes. Uh, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a, a style of writing that took a while. This was a man in a hurry. Uh, his, uh, his script is, his are mostly, they're mostly connected. There's a little bit of what they call a broken hand there in between some of the of, of the letters, uh, but this flows across the page. This is a modern hand, but it's more than 400 years old, and it gives us our first clue as to something about this man. Now, it's, this is, uh, this, uh, just to show you what's coming, this is this, uh, the, the, the big book that is about to descend uh, on the bookstores. It's, uh, we now have, we, I have, actually, I have one copy of it, uh, which is the, 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 the first bound of the pages. We'll have the, the bound books themselves uh, on the, in the week of September 10th, and then the books will be published, the publication date, with Simon & Schuster in, the, in New York and Knopf in Canada on the same day, on October 14th. And just at the moment, I remember 
the first um, uh, uh, really serious scholarly edition of Champlain's works, which was by Laverdier, the Abbey Laverdier. It's a magnificent piece of monotype uh, printing. And he uh, did the whole thing. It took him uh, 30 years, I think, something like that. Did the entire thing and he got his proof set like that. And that night there was a fire in the print shop and everything was burned. The type was melted. Nothing remained but this. And so they set it again and brought out what he called the second edition. The first edition was <laughs> just, just one, 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 an edition of one work. And it has, it's still the work that everybody uh, has to begin with who is a serious in, has a serious interest in, in Champlain. But uh, this, the question is, uh, uh, who was he and what did he look like? And uh, there are many, many images of Champlain. All of them are fictions. One of them is a fraud, which is the one that's most widely reproduced on the internet. Uh, and the only, the only one that is authentic is this. And it is reproduced here. This is a side turn, as a publisher says, uh, in an octavo volume. And Champlain, the man in the middle, is a little less than one inch high. Uh, and this is not only authentic, it's the only authentic image from his own time of any importance. There's some very rough sketches in others of his volumes. Uh, but it is also a self-portrait. He was himself an artist. And once he was being opposed by a, a group of rival businessmen in, uh, in, uh, in, in Normandy, and they uh, sent a letter uh, to, the, to the king saying, Champlain was just an artist and unfit for command. As a consequence, the king did not agree. But he was a very good artist, and uh, we have uh, quite a number of his work that, that bears testimony to it. Uh, the question is, what can we tell about him from this thing? So let's take a closer look. Uh, here he is, a uh, 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 close up, and um, uh, it, one can deconstruct this image. I like to do that more and more with my students. My students are raised to television, and they can process these images in a microsecond. Uh, they see things that escape their teachers. Uh, and to study this, as my students uh, study, is to, is to discover quite a lot of things about this figure that tell us something of, his, uh, 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 of what he was about. Uh, first of all, he is um, uh, wearing um, on the top of his, of his helmet uh, something that was called a panache in the this, in this 17th century. It's the or or origin of our word panache. And what it was was an elaborate uh, plume of curled feathers, which in this case were white, and the color and the shape and the curling of the feathers tells us that this man was a captain in the service of the first Bourbon king of France, who was Henry IV. Uh, the, the king, you'll see Henry IV in his panache in a, in a moment, uh, but he would lead his men into combat, and he would say, rallyez-vous à mon panache, and it became the great symbol uh, and it tells us of his connection uh, with a man uh, at the top. And then he's wearing a helmet that's of a very special kind. It's not the ordinary steel pot that was called a morion in the 17th century that we associate with conquistadors and with Jamestown colonists. This was, the, this was what the French called the Burgundian helmet, and a Burgundian helmet of a particular shape. And you'll see the same helmet in equestrian portraits of Charles V. Uh, it was a very elegant helmet indeed. Uh, it was at the front edge of technology in the period. Uh, the comb and helm of, the, of, the, uh, of, of, of it was uh, forged from a single piece of steel. And that's what he was wearing. I've talked to experts on uh, firearms in the 17th century about this weapon that he is carrying. And it turns out to be a very special weapon Indeed, uh, many historians have written about him as using an ordinary matchlock here, but if you look, there is no match. Uh, this was not a weapon that had one of those dangling cords smoldering uh, that, that would be used to ignite the powder. What this is is what was called an arquebus, which was an earlier predecessor of a musket. An arquebus a rouette. A rouette meant that it was a wheel lock. It was um, fired by the turning of a wheel. It was like a cigarette lighter. Uh, with a wheel, an abrasive wheel that would, that would uh, turn against a striker plate. And it was the first 
weapon uh, that was self-igniting. Uh, and it was also an arquebus a chasse, as it was called, a hunting arquebus, combining these two things, and that this hunting arquebus was one that could be fired from the shoulder without a crutch uh, underneath. It was a much lighter weapon. This was extremely expensive. It was produced in the basement of the Louvre. Uh, and it tells us something, again, about this man and his uh, preparation uh, for his job. He is equipped with the best technology of his time. And then we can look at his uh, half armor, as it was called, and he's wearing uh, on his thighs a very special kind of very light steel uh, uh, a set of plates uh, that were also uh, to the latest technology uh, in his time. And all of this uh, is only, only comes to us. It's never mentioned in any of his works, but we can begin to see something of this man from this tiny figure, one inch high, uh, in, that, uh, in that drawing. So the question is, um, who was he? Where did he come from? And we know a lot about what he did. He left us uh, a, a huge uh, corpus of writing. Uh, we have something like 2,700 pages of his writings about what he did. But few writers have ever written at such length and revealed so little about themselves. Uh, he tells us, he does not tell us how old he was. He doesn't tell us where he was born. He doesn't tell us uh, uh, tell anything about his education. Uh, he says very little about his family. We only know his mother's name from one reference in his marriage contract. Uh, and it's not merely that this material is omitted, but it is, I think, quite deliberately kept from us. There's a studied silence. And like that, that earlier figure that we saw, uh, he, is, he is hidden partly by his own hand. And that deepens this sense of puzzlement about who he was. Uh, the two scholars of our age who know him as well as anybody, uh, one is uh, Denis Bourgeois in, in Canada, and the other is Raymond Littelien in Paris, have both re re written recently that his, this man was surrounded by mystery the more they learn about him, the more mysterious he becomes. We know that he was a, a soldier. He, his self-portrait re represents himself as that. And when we begin to study his books on the subject of his soldiering, we discover that he, be, he lived by a soldier's ethic of honor and duty and courage. But he also came to hate war, for reasons we'll see in a moment. And yet, as he hated war, he also believed that some things in the world are worse than war, that evil was something real in the world, that the devil existed in the world and must be fought. And so he had all of these ideas in his writings. And the puzzle is, how did he square those ideas? And so that takes us into that part of it. He was not only a soldier, but he was a seaman. And we know that he made 27 Atlantic crossings from France uh, to, uh, to, to the New World. Uh, we also know that he never, except once, lost a ship, never on a transatlantic uh, crossing. And he may never have lost a man, as near as we can tell. There was one exception to that, which was he was a passenger on a bark uh, in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and they were close to the coast of Nova Scotia and were caught by a, a, a gale on a lee shore. And the captain, who was his friend, Pont Grave, I'll introduce him to you later, uh, was uh, suddenly stricken by a heart attack. Uh, and the, the, uh, as the boat was uh, heading toward disaster, Champlain came on deck, took command, set all the sails on board, drove that bark high on the rocks on the coast of Nova Scotia, wrecked the boat, it was reduced to kindling, but he saved every soul on board. And we can, we can see clues here uh, to this man who was something very special in the way of a seaman, particularly in these moments of a danger. Uh, we know that he was a discoverer and that he worked out a way of discovery that was unique to Champlain. He called it ferreting. Ferret partout, he said. 
and he went ferreting up and down the coast in, with a kind of attention to detail. It was an extremely dangerous way to do one's exploring. And, and he developed that, and it, it had an impact on another career that he was pursuing simultaneously. He was a map maker. And his maps are a marvel to experts on cartography. One of them observed that they are more accurate than his instruments were. And the puzzle is, how did he do that? And so in each part of his career, as we begin to peel back these layers one by, uh, one by one, we get yet more puzzles and mysteries about him. And I could run through this as to his career as an artist, of a founder, a, a person who uh, was an administrator. He was an, a courtier in France, a major uh, career there, a diplomat. And most of all, he had very special relations with the Indians. And each one of those stories is a, is a, is a puzzle. So I went looking, first of all, to find out where did he come from? How, what shaped him in his life? And as Judy and I were traveling uh, in, in, on, on these errands, um, we made a discovery for ourselves, which is how much of Champlain's world still survives. The, 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 the physical sites are still to be seen, and in many ways are remarkably little changed. This may be a world that we are losing, but it is not a world that we have lost. Uh, and the first place we went was where Champlain uh, began, at least had his childhood, and it's this town called Brouage, Brouage. And it's on the coast of France, along the Bay of Biscay, south of Brittany, north, south of La Rochelle, uh, north of Bordeaux, uh, and it, is a, it was a great seaport in the 16th century when Champlain was born, around 1570. But now look at its location. That's about two kilometers from the sea. And we drove into it, uh, onto this flat area of marshland uh, that was not quite like uh, terra firma. Uh, and as we drove across along an old road, taking a turn through a little copse of trees, we suddenly came on this town. It was what we were looking for. We'd seen lots of images of it. And still, it took us completely by surprise. To get into it is to find that the town is frozen in time. It was built over a period from, the, from about 1560 up until the late 17th, uh, and early 18th centuries. And then this area uh, began um, to uh, dry out. Uh, but at the same time, it suffered from severe infestations of malaria. And some of it was depopulated. And the town was almost abandoned uh, at one point in its career. And we, when we were there on a, a beautiful spring day, we back and forth several times, uh, it was our footsteps just it were echoed in the streets of this once a busy uh, seaport of a brouage. It, it is also in a province um, that it was a, the province of Saintonge, now the department of Chiron Maritime. Uh, and Champlain, in his first book, identified himself as Champlain of Brouage. In his later books, he identified himself as Champlain of Saintonge. And I think both of these places are very important to the man that he became. If we look at the next, this is, a, the, the town is stone built, uh, small houses on very narrow lots uh, the, at its peak. Uh, the, the real estate was very valuable. Uh, this was uh, this is uh, this is a, a front a house front that's very similar to the front of Champlain's house, which still stands. But this was two doors away, and the man who built this house was a Dutchman. And on the on the uh, on uh, the uh, up above on that lintel, uh, he has inscribed that Dutch um, uh, uh, prayer, who puts his trust in God, will build has built well. The date is. 1585, Champlain was about 15 and living just two doors away. And so we see this small paradoxical town, very small indeed, but very cosmopolitan, with people coming from all over the place. Uh, what they were coming for was the product of the marshes, salt. And there was a particular kind of salt that was produced there also that was very much in demand. It was a black salt. 
And Francis I made a gift of it to Henry VIII, and it, it became very fashionable in Europe and very valuable. And so there was an enormous trade. And then with the growth of the, of the fisheries in the Atlantic, suddenly the salt business was booming. And the result was that Champlain uh, was, uh, grew up in the midst of abundance. Uh, and it was said that Saintonge was itself the most affluent of all the provinces of France in this, uh, in this uh, uh, period. His parents were, uh, according to a local antiquarian uh, work that was published many years ago, were of fishing families. And not much was known about it except, except for that. And, but now we have, thanks to a French antiquarian scholar named Robert Leblanc, who is himself a, a, an archivist, uh, searched the provincial archives in France in the way that outsiders cannot do. And he began to turn up a, a few records, just three or four, of, of any importance for uh, Champlain's father. But we can put them together and study the terms uh, in those documents. And when we did that, what we found was a history. And it was his, his father begins as a pilot in a ship. A, a pilot was a, was a person who rose from the ranks. He worked for his salary uh, and even for wages. Uh, and he, it was, a, it was a, an important job, but it was, a, it was a humble job. And then a little bit later, he appears as a master. A master has moved into the ranks of management. And then a little after that, he becomes a captain. And after that, he became the captain of the King's Marine. And Champlain's father, his name was Anthony Champlain. He spelled his name many ways. I think he spelled it four ways on a single document. Uh, Andrew Jackson said he could never respect a man who only knows one way to spell a word. Uh, and there was, a, there was a good deal of that in, um, in, 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 Champlain's, uh, in Champlain's world. But uh, Champlain always spoke of his father with great respect. And we can see that he moved up very rapidly, and not only to the rank of captain, but then he became an owner, and he started to buy shares, which is the normal way, small shares in a large number of vessels. And soon they were owning two houses and then three modest houses uh, in the middling range of the, of the houses in, in, in the town. But it was clearly a, a, a family that was prospering, uh, as were his uncles and cousins. And there was always about Champlain an optimism that I think comes to people who grew up where in, that, in, in, in that process of, of, of uh, improvement. He never got much of an education. Uh, we can see that when we compare his writings with those of his friend, Marc Lescarbeau, who was a, a Latin scholar, uh, a classicist, who never used a small word when a big one would do. Uh, and uh, it, 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 we, Champlain, by, uh, by comparison, uh, writes a French that is in some ways very like Shakespeare's English. It's a muscular language. It's a language that draws uh, from the folk uh, speech. Of, of, his, uh, of, of his region. Uh, he did or may have gone to an academy uh, in Brouage. We have a traveler who described it at great length. We have no firm evidence that he was there, but we, uh, we, we can see that he learned what that academy taught. It was taught for young men who were of, uh, not necessarily the no, of aristocracy, but were on their way into the army uh, they learned to shoot, uh, they learned to ride, they learned to dance and to play the mandolin. Uh, we don't have a mandolin in Champlain's account, but everything else was a skill that he mastered at an early age. But mainly his school was the sea, and his teacher was his father. And he tells us that he went to sea at a very early age. Uh, first, uh, in the harbor of Brouage, uh, learning uh, the skill of piloting, that is to say, in the sense of, of, uh, of, of sailing in coastal waters, and then into the Bay of Biscay, and then, in, uh, uh, then out into learning the skills of blue water sailing uh, in the Atlantic. He also, as his father rose through the ranks, he began to learn about commerce. He learned about the problem of managing a crew, and also of dealing uh, with passengers and investors and all the difficult problems that came that way. He learned how to deal with danger because the coastal waters of France were very dangerous indeed. 
they were infested with corsairs. The French Navy was unable to protect its own coastal waters. And when the French uh, wanted to send an ambassador to Turkey, they had to hire a ship from Genoa uh, to do it. Uh, and many ships were seized uh, by, uh, by uh, African pirates, by, uh, by corsairs, and Champlain learned how to survive in that very dangerous world. He also acquired something from this world that was around him. Let's go back. First of all, I'll go forward to that. This is this province called Saintonge, and uh, 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 Brouage is the, the, the indentation up to the far left is the Gulf of Saintonge, and on the lower right of that indentation was where Brouage, uh, the town of Brouage, uh, was. And you'll see just north of it the town of La Rochelle, and then to the south is the Gironde uh, estuary uh, and uh, it, it, where uh, the city of Bordeaux uh, is. And uh, this was a, the, a, a culture that had its own language. It takes its name uh, from a Celtic tribe, the Santoni, and they had a very a distinct uh, sense of themselves. They were great survivors. Uh, in dangerous times, they survived in the marshes. Uh, the Romans conquered the place. And, the, and villas went up, and then the villas uh, dis, uh, were ruined, and, uh, and the people of Saint-Ange uh, survived through that, uh, intermarrying with some of these uh, Roman, Roman settlers. Uh, it's an area that has the, uh, let's go back um, to, uh, it's an area that has more days of sunshine than any other part of France. Uh, and it has a huge, great sky uh, that, uh, that uh, a big sky that just looms over this whole area, uh, bright blue, and then much of Saint-Ange, both the coastal regions, and also the areas along the rivers are close to the water, and they speak of the water as the robe blue uh, that, that, was, uh, that, that, uh, that cloaked this very beautiful region. Uh, the, inner, uh, part, the inland parts uh, are the cognac country of France, produce the best brandy uh, in the in, in the world, and the coastal areas were very prosperous, as I mentioned uh, uh, before. And uh, it's a culture that has a very peculiar uh, quality. When we got into the, to the there is a dialect, at least in, in, um, in Paris it's called a dialect, in Saint-Ange it's called the language. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful language. It has lots of words that are uniquely their own. It has a symbol, this culture, and language. The symbol is a snail, uh, which in uh, which in Saint-Ange is called a cagoule, cagoule, not escargot as in metropolitan uh, France. And uh, there are cagoules on 11th century churches uh, in France. And the people who live there call themselves cagoulard, cagoulard, the snail people. Champlain was a cagoulard. When he traveled in New France, he described the botany of New, uh, sorry, when he traveled in New Spain, he described the botany of New Spain in words that a French botanist has analyzed, and he said it could only have been done by a person who could speak the dialect of Saint-Ange uh, in the 16th century. One of their uh, uh, words, it's a very happy language, and one of their, uh, their, their, their words is for themselves, if they combine two words, Ghoul is their word for mouth, uh, not de bouche. And, uh, they, uh, and uh, they, uh, Benise is their principal word for happy. And they call themselves uh, ghoul Benise, happy mouths. Uh, and they speak that way. And they have a, an easygoing way about them uh, that Champlain acquired. The, in, one of the Huron one, once commented in the hearing of a Jesuit missionary. He said to Champlain, you always say something to cheer us up. Uh, and there was that style that was part of this culture uh, of, uh, of, of Saint-Ange. They have lots of, of, uh, of folk sayings. And the, the motto of the region is a saying that he who goes easy goes far. And Champlain learned that and used it. And not only Champlain, but there were two great leaders of New France. One of them was Champlain, and the other was the Sieur de Mont. And he also was a cagoulard. He came from the town of Royan, just on the northern uh, uh, side of the Gironde estuary. And he had that same style of leading. The other thing that's interesting about this place is that it was a kind of border province. It was on the border of two language and cultural regions 
On one side, to the south, was the Long Dock, the Long Dock. To the north was the Long Doy, uh, uh, dis, uh, distinguished by the way they pronounced the word for yes. Uh, and in between was this very special region. It was between the, the ecology of the Mediterranean, the ecology of, 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 of the North Atlantic, uh, and it was between different ethnic groups. And Champlain grew up in the midst of diversity, both in this town and also in this region. And he was comfortable with it. It was even within his own family. He had, he had an uncle in uh, Provence, who was called Uncle Provençal. Uh, he had uh, cousins in, in, in La Rochelle. Uh, and these men, Champlain and, uh, and, uh, and the Sieur de Mont, were very good at dealing with people who were unlike themselves. And as more people came from more parts of France to New France, these men of Saintonge had particular roles as mediators uh, that he would follow all of, his, all of his life. And then there was something else that was peculiar about Champlain. He and his family had a very special relationship with a man at the top. And here he is, Henry IV of France, a wonderful character, one of my great heroes, a charming rogue, I think one would have to say. And you can see this, and there's something of an air of a, of a fawn or a satyr uh, in this image. I think some of his Catholic um, opponents, he, uh, he uh, converted to Catholicism three times. <laughs> Uh, and the, and the, there was a certain absence of trust about uh, Henry IV, and you can you can see this in his uh, in his uh, in in this wonderful character sketch of Henry IV in in mid uh, in, in mid uh, career. Uh, he came from another very special part of France. He came from Bern in the in the, in the mountains of southwestern France, and the mountains made there was a sense that Germans say mountains make people free. Uh, and uh, there was a sense of, uh, of freedom in that, uh, in that culture. He was raised as a Protestant, uh, and uh, his, uh, he was uh, of the House of Bourbon, uh, which had high ambitions and great rivalries with other uh, houses, and all of these great houses aspired to follow the House of Valois as the ruling house of, of, uh, of France. He was called the King of Hearts, and they meant that in several ways at once. He had an eye for the women of France. He is known to have had 58 mistresses of record. Uh, and there were other liaisons uh, beyond accounting. Uh, and he, also, he was also the king of hearts in another way. He cultivated a closeness with his people. He, many other leaders, uh, on the, sort of the Washington model, uh, sought strength in distance. But there are many accounts of Henry IV uh, walking arm in arm or hand in hand with, with some of his, uh, with, with his subjects. He would like to dress in disguise and go out amongst uh, the people of France uh, without revealing himself uh, to them and was very closely in touch. He, he, did, he gave very little attention uh, to, uh, uh, to any sort of uh, air. He gave, spent very little money on costume, often dressed in rags. Uh, he was not notable for hygiene. He, uh, experienced court, courtiers always uh, learned uh, to approach him upwind. Uh, uh, but uh, but he, was, uh, he was an extraordinarily able uh, and skillful uh, man. And then he had something special in his relationship with the Champlain family. All of them began to get many favors from first the prince and then later in the 17, uh, 1590s from the, uh, from, the, from the king. And the favors came most, uh, 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 most generously to Samuel Champlain himself. And um, I'm wondering what the root of that may have been. There is something that's one part of the mystery about this man, and it's been commented on by Marcel Trudel, who's one of the great, uh, really, a, a superb Canadian historian, has written the major work on the history of New France, and also Hubert Deschamps, who is a professor in the Sorbonne, and they both have written that they suspect that Champlain was the illegitimate son of some very prominent family. And the thought occurs to me, could he have been the illegitimate son of Henry IV, 
we will see that there are some, uh, there are many, again, it's these anomalies that so catch my eye. There's a passage in Champlain's writings, a very brief reference, but he said that he was obligé, bound to Henry IV, de naissance, by birth. It's a curious phrase. And I don't know what he meant by that, but there's a possibility. Now, when Champlain was born, it was about 1570, uh, his, Henry IV's mother was living in, in La Rochelle, about 30 miles north of Brouage. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a drawing of Henry IV in the birth year of Champlain. He was 18 years old. He was mature for that age, I would say. And he was sexually active, to say the least. Uh, and I think it's at least conceivable that he may have uh, 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 fathered uh, Champlain. We know that Champlain, at an early date, receives a pension from Henry IV before any of the acts for which Champlain was remembered. We know that Henry IV sent Champlain on secret missions when Champlain was very young. Uh, we know that uh, Champlain was ordered to come to court in the Louvre and at Fontainebleau because the king said he wanted to keep him near his person, quote unquote. We know that others in Champlain's family got many presents. He had a cousin in La Rochelle, as I mentioned, and the husband of his cousin was given a job with not the most exalted title. He was chief whip whipper of the dogs in the royal kennel. <laughs> but it appears to have paid well. And he put it on all of his, uh, all of his uh, legal documents, which is the reason that we know about that. Uh, this was when Champlain's father became not only a captain, but a captain of the King's Marine. It was when his uncle Provençal uh, got many uh, favors as well. If Champlain was given the title of Samuel de Champlain, uh, the particle of noblesse. It did not mean that he was of the nobility. But it was a distinction in the 16th century that came to people, not necessarily nobled, who did something to deserve it, uh, some sort of, uh, of distinction of, uh, of achievement in a career of great age, uh, which would, was, did not apply here, uh, as did the achievements when, it, when he first got it. Or it could have been an expression of some anomaly of rank in this man who was the son of, of two people from fishing families, and yet had this very special relationship with the king. I hasten to add that the hard evidence in support of this hypothesis is approximately zero. <laughs> and so as a consequence, I put no weight on it in my book at all, except to mention it as a possibility. So there is a puzzle to solve here about the relationship of this man this humble subject, with a great king. And whatever the source of that relationship was, the consequences were profound for Champlain. I think almost every historian would agree, without Henry IV, there would be no Champlain as we know him. Uh, because Champlain saw in the king not merely uh, a monarch, but also a mentor, a patron, and a friend. Uh, and the most important of all of his mentors and patrons in the course of his career. Uh, and then as uh, Champlain and Henry IV lived in terrible times in France, uh, in the 1560s, civil war began uh, between Protestants and Catholics. And here in 1572 was that terrible scene in Paris, the, the, the massacre of St. Bartholomew. It happened on Henry, it was not yet Henry IV, he's Prince Henry of Bern. It happened just after his wedding day. He and his, his mother uh, and uh, others uh, in the, around the king at that time thought that they could keep the peace by marrying Henry, uh, Prince Henry to Margaret de Valois, an extraordinary woman, and the marriage uh, uh, happened. And something like 1,500 uh, uh, Huguenot leaders came into Paris to, uh, to witness the marriage. And after the marriage, there was a rising. There was a great fear that spread through the Catholic court 
They feared that these Huguenots would rise against them, and they struck instead. And something like 15 or 1,700 Huguenots were, were murdered in one terrible day in Paris, and then thousands more in France all through the, the kingdom. And after that, there were from 1561, 1562 uh, to 1598, there were nine civil wars of religion, nine civil wars. There were between two and four million people dead in a country that had about 19 million people. Imagine, compare that with our civil war, 670,000 people are killed in our civil war, four years of that terrible violence, and it is still a scar on our national memory, and then compare that with what the people of France went through in this, in, 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 in this generation of 40 years of agony. And not only the number of deaths, but the atrocities were beyond imagining, and Champlain, Henry IV, were the witnesses to all of this. And they went to war in the last of these uh, civil wars of religion in an effort to reunite their country. And the incredible thing is that Henry IV succeeded in doing that. He was fighting the Catholic League, as it was called, who brought in Spanish, Italian, Irish troops. And they, uh, they, they plundered the, the countryside, turned the people of France, even the Catholic majority, many of them, uh, to the support of Henry IV, who converted this for the third time. Uh, and, um, but it was not a, a, a conversion of, of convenience entirely. Uh, this man was deeply religious, uh, as Champlain was as well. We think Champlain was born a Protestant, mainly because his parents named him Samuel. And Samuel was that very upright Jewish judge who made life miserable for people in offices above him. Uh, and it was a name that the Protestants liked to use. It was the third most popular name in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's probably a pretty good clue that, that Samuel Champlain started as Protestant. Uh, but then he converted, probably in the same year, 1593, uh, that Henry IV uh, converted. Uh, and uh, they, uh, here's Henry IV. Oh, let me go back again. Here's Henry IV. There's a panache, the ultimate panache. Look at those curled feathers on the top. And he turned out to have a genius for war in that white panache of this black armor that was meant to make him very visible on the battlefield, sorry. Uh, and uh, he led from the front. Uh, and uh, one of his supporters, the Duke of Sully, whom we'll meet in a moment, uh, gave him the best artillery in, in Europe. And he defeated all of those armies that came against him. In 1594, Champlain joined the army and was sent into the worst of these wars, which was in Brittany. And here is the, um, the it's Crozon. Uh, it's, a, it's a peninsula just south of Brest, a very rocky escarpment. Uh, it was a Spanish fortress. And Champlain was in an army uh, that took it by storm after many defeats, horrific ca uh, casualties. And with, with the fall of Crozon, uh, the western tip of Brittany opened up, and Henry IV got control of the last stronghold of the Catholic, of the Catholic League. Uh, and Henry uh, 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 Champlain had a, another sort of schooling in the army. He learned to lead in the army. Uh, became an aide, it's interesting to see how rapidly he rose, became an aide to three of the marshals of France, and then sent on those secret missions that I mentioned before. Then what he did was to be given command first as an ensign, lieutenant, a captain. He ended the war as a captain, uh, now uh, actually in a line command. It was the same sequence of steps that he would follow later in, uh, in uh, New France. This, this uh, 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 photograph was taken by Judy Fisher. Uh, as we follow Champlain uh, 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 everywhere that we knew that he went. Uh, and uh, here again, on Crozon, uh, was uh, uh, an area that was preserved almost without change uh, from the way that Champlain uh, would have known it. The, the, uh, the, the Spaniards resisted almost to the last man. A few were captured, returned with honor because of their defense. And so brutal was this world that their their commanders ordered them to be executed for having been taken alive. 
and that was the world he was living in. He was here fighting side by side with a British army. And its commander was another major figure in the history of exploration. It's Martin Frobisher. And here he is. Uh, and they, they would have had time to talk. They both fought in the climactic battle. And uh, in that battle, Frobisher was killed, uh, mortally wounded. Uh, and, but this was a, a portrait that he commissioned. Uh, and you can see something of the character of Martin Frobisher pointing a pistol almost in the direction of the painter. Uh, and uh, he was a man famous for courage and cruelty. And they would have talked about America, probably, if they had talked at all. And I think as they were, they were soldiering together, it's very likely. Uh, and uh, Frobisher had explored the north, northernmost reaches of, of, uh, of North America. Uh, and what he did was instantly to get embroiled in, in intense hostilities uh, with the Inuit who were here, and not only did he do that, uh, but he celebrated all of this violence and these sorts of scenes. And then at this, in this battle at Bloody Point, he, he captured an old Inuit woman, and he ordered his men to strip off her clothing to see if she had cloven feet. And there was a sense of Frobisher confronting these American natives as if they were not of the same species of humanity. And Champlain knew Martin Frobisher well enough to speak of him in a kind of personal way. Uh, and then after that, 1598, the war came to an end, triumph for Henry IV. Uh, he was able to impose a policy of toleration on the people of, uh, of, on the nation of France. It was that edict of not of an established Catholic church, but tolerance for Protestants, except in Protestant areas where there was an established Protestant church with toleration for Catholics. It was very complicated, but it worked. Uh, this was a treaty called the Treaty of Vervins, which imposed a general peace on Europe. Most of the crowned heads of Europe signed on to it. It also imposed a peace on the North, uh, the North Atlantic, and which had been dominated by the Spanish Navy, which was by far the most powerful. And what happened was that now the North Atlantic was open to the French, the English, the Dutch. And in 1598, Champlain was in, uh, oh, let's see, I was going to show you something else, but um, Champlain was uh, in Brittany, unemployed, demobilized from the army, looking for something new, and he was in a place called Port Louis, he called it Blavet, a little, a little seaport on the south of Brittany. And as he, uh, he looked out from, from that seaport, by the way, it's totally preserved, almost totally preserved, as Champlain knew it, uh, partly because there have been huge uh, other modern seaports that have grown up nearby. And he was interested in America. He'd been hearing so much about that in Brouage and I think in Brittany. He knew the king was interested. Their purposes were not merely French and European, but, uh, but American as well. And he thought that he might um, go on a, on a mission of what would really amount to be an espionage mission into the Spanish Empire. Now it was after the Peace of Bervan, it was, it was accessible uh, to a French a Catholic. And what he did was to, through his uncle Provencel, was, uh, he was able to spend about two years uh, in the Spanish Empire. And he wrote an elaborate document which survives in manuscript in the John Carter Brown Library uh, in Providence. And it was written for one man. It was written for Henry IV. And it was elaborately illustrated. These illustrations are very crude. Uh, it's very difficult to reproduce them. We, uh, you have to see these things that the at, at, at Brown University to, to really to, to value them. They're luminous watercolors. And what he did was not only to describe the military defenses of New Spain, but he also began to study the condition of the Indians and the African slaves. He became very interested in them. He came, went out of his way to meet them. And then he was appalled by their treatment by the Spanish. And in this document that he submitted to the king, he painted watercolors of the of the cruelties that were visited upon the Indians in New Spain. This is an image of the Mexican Inquisition uh, burning alive Indians uh, for heresy. And it was painted by Champlain to make a point that this was no way to run an empire. And then he went, he went also, uh, this was an image of a, of a Catholic parish church and of Indians being flogged for not showing up for mass. 
And that was sent uh, to the king as well. And then um, he went, uh, he was able to get a, get a passage to a little island called Margarita Island, the Latin word for pearl. And it was the center just off the coast of Venezuela of the Spanish pearl fisheries. And the work was done by pearl slaves who made free dives in very deep water under extreme duress. First, they were Indians. By Champlain's time, the Indians had all been, they were all dead. And they'd been replaced by African slaves. And Champlain painted this image of these free divers. It was the only thing free about this system. It was also, by the way, the first documented case of total overfishing. Um, and the, some ecologists have gotten very interested in, in, in it. But Champlain was haunted by this scene of brutality, cruelty. And so he came back, delivered this to the, to the king, and the king ordered him to come and stay in the Louvre. The king had just built this gigantic gallery. This is a model of the expanded Louvre that Henry IV had built, uh, this grand, uh, the Grand Gallery, it was called, running along the banks of the river Seine. And on the top, there was an enormous uh, open, long open promenade where the king would walk arm in arm with his subjects. In the basement was, an instit was a, res a research and development center. Uh, and amongst the other things were lots of geographers, cartographers, navigators. And Henry IV gave Champlain employment there as a, uh, as a royal geographer, one of many. Uh, and this was, this, this was also another sort of school for Champlain. As it, it was a school of manners, a school of politics. He was, again, just amazed by Henry IV. Henry IV said, he, I'm often accused of avarice, but I spend money uh, for three causes without any restriction. I make war, I make love, and I build. Uh, and here was this gigantic building in which Champlain is learning about the world. Uh, they mapped the first, they did the first maps of all the provinces of, of France. And Henry IV was interested also in the New World. And Champlain was giving the, given the job of learning more about it. And as he did, he began to form what he called his grand design and spoke to the king about the design that he had. And it was the design for an empire that would be different from the empires of New Spain or the explorations of the English. And uh, so uh, he, they ordered, they, he spent quite a lot of time in the town of Dieppe uh, uh, working with a man named Aymar de Chast, who was an extraordinary figure. Uh, there were quite a number of figures around Henry IV who were French humanists. These men were the heirs to the Renaissance. They were the inspiration of the Enlightenment. And what they did was to keep alive that humanist tradition in these terrible times that France and much of Western Europe went through in the 16th and early 17th centuries. And they were very interested in humanity. It was a Catholic humanism. It was a humanism that was framed with that idea of a universal church. Uh, and they, uh, they had a, formed this idea of reaching out to people throughout the world. Uh, and that empire was to be part of that, of that effort. And the, the first part that Champlain went to work on is this, the St. Lawrence Valley. And this was, he went along, his job was to go along as cartographer. But more than that, he was to report everything to the king. You can imagine how his colleagues felt about that. Uh, but off he went, and they arrived. This is the St. Lawrence uh, River flowing left to right. And then at the top is the Saguenay River. It's one of the most beautiful rivers I have ever seen. If you haven't seen the Saguenay, go there. As Champ uh, the, uh, Parkman tells his historians, they said, the first, go there, do it, then write it. And I recommend that sequence for you as well. And they anchored there in that little circular harbor. It looks just the same today, except there's a big hotel in the middle. But uh, it's, and, and then they, they were beginning to think, they met Champlain and the commander of the expedition, this man named Pont Grabe uh, from Saint-Malo. They were thinking about the Indians. They wanted to make connections with the Indians. And just by chance, across the Saguenay River, it's more than a mile across the river, there is a point to which it's called the, the point de Alouette, the, the Lark's Point, 
uh, Champlain called it uh, St. Matthew's Point. They looked across and they saw a huge gathering of Indians. Champlain estimated their numbers at more than a thousand, hundreds of canoes. And what he did, Champlain and, uh, and Pont Grave, and they had two young Montanais princes, they called them, who had come to, been, had come to France. They'd been brought by Pont Grave to learn the language, to be translators. And the four of them got into a shallop, and off they went across the Saguenay River. And when they got there, there was a festival in progress. This is another group of Indians in another century. Uh, this is a, a Catlin's painting of a Mandan festival. The Mandan were a, a, a nation that lived near the Great Lakes. They made contact with Champlain's Truchemont, his interpreters. Then they moved out, and instead of building their birch bark uh, wigwams, they were building these earth uh, 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 things. But what they did were to preserve the, this custom of a tabaji, of tobacco feast with lots of celebrations with these complex symbols uh, and dances going on. And Champlain and Pont Grevé, without arms, walked into the middle of this uh, gathering of three Indian nations, the Montanay, various Algonquian-speaking Indians from the Northwest, and then uh, the Etchemin, as they call them, from Maine. And they were welcomed. Uh, and uh, they were invited to join the Tabaji. They stayed all night. And the next morning, their host, Anada Bijou, his name was, uh, woke up and shouted to everybody that they were going to go across the Saguenay River and to visit with their friends, the French. And they did it, and they did it all over again. And there were speeches and exchanges. And in the end, they made a kind of understanding. It was an alliance. And it lasted for 10 generations between the French and all of, of those three uh, 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 great sprawling nations, uh, the Montanay and the Etchemin and the Algonquian. And Champlain uh, did that not only once, but he did it many times. I'm running short on time here, so I'm going to uh, move much more quickly. I think what happened was after they found it, St. Croix, and you all know about St. Croix and the St. Croix River, Champlain got a sp very special kind of boat. It's here in the corner. It's called a petoche. It was a little boat designed for reconnaissance. And uh, it, what he, was, he got orders from the Sieur de Mont, who was in command at St. Croix, uh, to explore the coast of Norumbega, uh, by which he meant the Penobscot Valley in particular, but more generally the coast of Maine. And they were looking for a place that was a good site for settlement. And after that brutal winter at St. Croix, the Sieur de Mont suggested that it should also be warm. Uh, and so they headed south. And there, was a, there were three voyages. Champlain was the commander of the first. He was now given command responsibility. The second was led by the Sieur de Mont. The third was led by another officer named Poutrincourt. Three uh, voyages, three captains, the same mission, three different results. What Champlain did uh, was to head um, uh, that, uh, that gruesome image. Uh, maybe I should explain that in passing. That's a, um, that is one of the, the, uh, the, the, the bodies that was dug up by Stephen Pendry and others uh, on uh, St. Croix Island, that terrible problem with scurvy. They performed an autopsy on this man. Look at the top of his head. Uh, and this was done by CAT scans at the Bar Harbor Hospital uh, here. And uh, it, it was completely confirms Champlain's account of all of this as do one piece of archaeology after uh, uh, another. But Champlain got into his patache, and he sailed south. He also care, took with him on one of these voyages uh, a woman who was a translator. Uh, you'll see her, this, and he uh, painted uh, an image. This is a woman, the full title up there is cropped, is figure of the Sauvage Amouchiquois. She was of a, of a group called the Amouchiquois who lived on the Sacco River. And this was the only, she was called the Woman of Pan Pannonius and worked with Champlain as his translator uh, for, in, in, in part of this uh, in, in, for part of this thing. And they, they worked south, and they got down to the Penobscot River, went up to Bangor, what is now Bangor. And there, Champlain met another group of Indians, went right into the center of them, and had exactly the same sort of impact that he had had 
when he had met those Indians on the Saguenay River. Uh, this time it was with a group of the, what we now called the Wabanaki Confederacy. Uh, and they made an alliance which also lasted for more than two centuries. Uh, and he had a genius for that work. Then the Sierra de Mons led this group into the, the southern Maine and down as far as Cape Cod. He also was a humanist, but humanism wasn't enough. He was a little bit frightened of the Indians. He never mixed with them in the way that Champlain did. And the result was suspicion, distance. They took that as arrogance and hostility. And in the end, there was fighting. And in that mid-coast area, the French were never able to make an alliance. Poutrincourt did the same thing, Cape Cod. And the same thing happened. Their fighting broke out. Poutrincourt went ashore, not alone, but with a file of infantry. He, he took the crops out of the fields of the Indians without, by your leave. Uh, he erected a cross without consulting. Champlain always was very careful to consult with the Indians and bring them into anything of that sort. Uh, the Indians uh, uh, became very distant, very hostile, and then attacked the French. Uh, and so three, uh, three leaders, three very different results. Champlain, unique this way, and doing it again and again uh, with many, many Indian nations uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the St. Lawrence Valley. Uh, then uh, they um, finally found another alternative to St. Croix, and it was that wonderful site, a very happy colony at Port Royal. Uh, and uh, at Port Royal, they um, made another, there were more uh, uh, tabagies with the, the, the Micmac, and the same thing happened. Uh, this keeps on repeating again and again with, uh, with a Champlain. Uh, the colony was a great success in terms of its settlement and relations with the Indians, but it was a commercial disaster. Uh, and uh, the company failed. The, uh, the Port Royal was abandoned. Uh, they went back and presented the King of France with a flock of Canadian geese uh, that swam in the, the, the Fontainebleau. Uh, and their honking was a kind of sad chorus on the fate of New France, and it looked as if it might be over once again, disaster after many other disasters. Uh, and then um, Champlain and um, the Sieur de Mont managed to get, uh, uh, cobble together another small uh, commercial venture. And what they did in 1608 was to plant a settlement in Quebec. And this one made a go of it. The same problems with scurvy, the same successes with the Indians. More trouble with his men. He had trouble with his servants. He had trouble with the laborers. This vision of humanity extended to all, embraced all the Indians, but not the servants. Uh, and four of them tried to murder Champlain. Uh, this had often happened in other uh, colonies, French colonies, and had too often succeeded. Champlain got wind of it, acted with great decision and extreme brutality. Uh, the leader uh, was, uh, received a summary trial uh, and was sentenced to death, and Champlain ordered his instant execution. And his head was cut off and put on top of a pike on top of the settlement. In Quebec, uh, this was a man who was, could be very brutal uh, in situations such as that. This was what this, the, the settlement uh, looked like. Uh, in, in Quebec, and uh, then um, he began to have troubles as he was forming this relationship with Indians up and down the St. Lawrence, but one group eluded him, and it was the Mohawk, and uh, he went to war with the Mohawk. His object was not to conquer them, but to raise the cost of their raiding in the St. Lawrence Valley, and this was the battle that resulted. It was uh, in, uh, the, in late June in 1609 on the banks of, of what he named uh, uh, Lake Champlain, uh, and it was a decisive victory. It was that arquebus uh, that made it possible. Uh, and then he fought another battle. The Indians, by the way, up to this point, fought in close order formation. They wore armor. They, it was wooden armor, hardwood armor, uh, hardened in the fire, and held together by cotton threads. And it was proof against uh, Neolithic arrowheads, but not against the arquebus. Uh, and after these battles, the Indians changed their tactics and went to that open system of war that we associate with the Indians. Revolution 
in, in, in warfare in America that happened with these first fights between uh, Champlain and his Indian allies and those of the, uh, of, the, of the Iroquois. And then after this success for Champlain, what, one thing that happened after he fought the Iroquois was that there was peace with the Mohawk. There were two battles, and after the second battle, peace for a period of about 20 years. Uh, and he was succeeding even with them uh, for a time. But then disaster at home. Henry IV assassinated, 1610. Uh, his son, the Dauphin, the future Louis XIII, too young uh, to uh, take the throne. Uh, and so it passed to uh, his, the mother, uh, Marie de Medici. She was Austrian-Italian and had no interest in America. Uh, start, caused a palace revolution, bitterly hated. Uh, in France, uh, really uh, uh, undercut much of what Champlain was trying to do, and he had to start over in France. She also banished the Sieur de Mont, who remained Protestant, and the Sieur de Mont asked Champlain now to take complete command of the American uh, initiative, which he tried to do under uh, Queen, uh, under, under uh, uh, Marie de Medici, and he began to have quite a lot of difficulty, but he had help. There was an American circle of humanists at the court. This was a, a, a man named Boulard de Sillery, who shared those humane values, that dream that Champlain had of creating a new sort of, of presence in the new world in which Indians would be treated decently uh, and without exploitation. And they helped him get his footing under uh, Marie uh, de Medici. This was another one named Pierre Janine. He brought in a series of viceroys who were princes of the blood related uh, to the House of Bourbon. There were seven of them. Only one of them came to America. The rest uh, remained in France. They were very difficult characters, but vital to the success of New France. They all had one thing in common. They appointed Champlain their lieutenant, their chief lieutenant in America. And what he did was to be able to get on with all of these very uh, uh, eccentric uh, uh, figures and to make it worse, this was the first, uh, the Prince of Condé. Uh, and he also married, and he married a, a child. Uh, uh, her name was Helen Boulet. She was the son of a very high-ranking um, bureaucrat in the court. And there, we have no image of Helen Boulet. This is one of Georges de Latour's uh, young women who about the same age, same era uh, in Paris. Uh, she was a, 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 a well-born Parisienne. Uh, and uh, the marriage, she was so young, she was 12. Uh, Champlain was 40, that, that, that they were, they, the, under the terms of the contract, they were not to live together for two years. Then the two years passed. She went to move in with Champlain. And uh, before the day was done, she was a fugitive. She fled. Uh, from her husband, was persuaded to go back. Uh, the, the, the marriage had been a success in terms of Champlain's purposes at court. It was a disaster in its domestic uh, dimensions. Uh, and then he came back to um, America. And here there was another round of hostilities with the central Uro Iroquois, probably uh, with the Onondaga, uh, who had been raiding in the far west. More fighting. This was in, on Lake Onondaga, in the, what is now the city of Syracuse, of New York. Um, Champlain thought it was a defeat, uh, but it was a success by the standards of Indian warfare, and it put a stop to the hostilities involving the Onondaga and the Oneida uh, for another a long a period. And then I won't go into more detail. I'm going to stop in a few minutes and just say that Champlain had to reinvent this operation again and again. There was a palace revolution against Marie de Medici. And in came now uh, the, uh, uh, the grown uh, Dauphin, Louis XIII. And Champlain went to work winning him over. He had a great interest in a uh, palace. Um, he, his passion was theater. And the theatricals that were staged began to include quite a lot of Indians from North America. And Champlain was working, reaching Louis XIII through his theatricals. And it was a success. It began to, it began to succeed. Came back. He made a, a kind of a reconciliation with his wife. They returned to Quebec from 1620 to 1624. It was a happy time for both of them. 
Uh, she was very bright, a very interesting. By the way, that, that we're getting lots of, of archaeology from the site of their habitation. That was probably Champlain's writing set uh, that turned up in the soil of Quebec. Here is a 19th century image of Helene Boule um, uh, with Indian children. And, and, and she wore a little mirror from her neck. And an Indian woman came and said, why can I see my reflection on that mirror uh, in front of your chest? And Helene Boulay said, because you are so close to my heart. And she won over the Indian women. They spent much time together. And she got caught up in this dream of Champlain's about a better world uh, between the, uh, the Europeans and the Indians. Uh, these are more uh, um, uh, 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 pieces that are coming out of the archaeology. Then he had to do it all over again, reinvent it now because this figure had appeared. Cardinal Richelieu, very difficult, a completely different set of values uh, from a, a Champlain. And they found a way to get on together. But no sooner had he done that, uh, then war broke out between England and France, mainly over um, uh, this queen, Henrietta Maria, the sister of Louis XIII. The war led to hostilities in America, and Quebec was captured by English freebooters, the first uh, conquest of Quebec by the British. And here is Champlain, forced to hand over his sword uh, to these English uh, conquerors. And then he came back, and he wrote another big book, his biggest book, designed to persuade the people of France to get New France back again and to persuade the King of England to surrender it, to give it, to give it up. And he succeeded. Uh, these are the booksellers, the bookstalls, uh, where uh, his books would be settled. He did a great, uh, he also did a, his best map. And the map is a documentation of New France uh, and its sovereignty. And it was peddled uh, in Western Europe by these itinerant map sellers. And finally, it succeeded. The, there had been a dowry that had not been paid. Charles was trying to rule Parliament without a, without a he had ruled England without a Parliament. Uh, he uh, urgently needed the money and agreed to surrender New France. And back it came. And off Champlain went again to Quebec. Uh, this time he was called the governor by all who lived there, but not by Richelieu, who didn't trust him, kept him on a very short lease. And Champlain began to do something else. What he did was to found three dynamic French populations, that is to say, strong enough to grow by natural increase. And he brought in the, the was, uh, uh, I don't know of a case of scurvy aboard Champlain's uh, ships, though there, were, there was scurvy enough on other ships. But these were all cases of scurvy in these, uh, in these small settlements almost always in the winter. And the question was, um, Champlain, he was quick to identify it as a dietary disease, uh, slow to identify it as something that was that anti that was the scorbutic problem and so forth. Though the Dutch and the Spanish had already found that, were using um, a citrus uh, 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 products in, in the, their, their trips to the, the East Indies. He thought that there was uh, something in fresh meat that protected people from scurvy. Every nutritionist I talked to said no way. Uh, but he was convinced, and other people were as well. I think he also got help from the Indians in various herbal things. And after the first two, three winters, they, they no longer had a major problem with scurvy. They found a way to, to, to deal with that. Profoundly important. I would, I, I would say he's, uh, I, with these two men, I would say were equally important. And in the early years, I would say Dugas was, uh, let's say Pierre, de, uh, uh, Pierre de Gaulle, he, that his, uh, we, uh, I call him the Sieur de Mont, same man, uh, was more important than Champlain, was running the show. Uh, that was the case through 1610. And then after that, he no longer was able to, to do that. He re remained a kind of silent partner continued, even though he had a title of nobility and was not supposed to be investing in trade, uh, but he did that anyway. But now Champlain uh, takes, the, takes the lead. So I, I would say that Champlain is unique in the length of his service through that period. Uh, Demont more important early on, 
They got on very well together, shared a kind of community of value that was the key to, to this. Uh, pertaining about which what what controversy? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I, my, my view of that, which is pretty much the same as Morrison, though with some, some differences, is that he sailed up to the top of Frenchman Bay, not around the island, which I don't think he could have done, but he, he was the first person to map it as an island, as you know. Uh, but then he sailed, I believe what he did after that was just, he went ferreting again down along the coast, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the directions, the east coast of, of, of the island, and I believe that he hit the rock that is off of Otter Cliffs, that there's a, there's a shoal there which is uh, invisible at high water, uh, though, though, though the, the, you see the, the, the waves breaking over it uh, at, 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 at Yes, I, I, I understand. Uh, and I went out in Ed Blair's boat, and we tried to test these possibilities, and we sailed so close to that shoal on Otter Cliffs that I thought that picnic boat was a goner, but, <laughs> but, uh, but we, we survived it. And I think it's the right distance for sailing just around uh, Otter Point and fetching up in Otter Creek, uh, where he could have careened that patache. And then we can follow him from, from there sailing on around the south, uh, the south side of the island. That's the, that's, I think that fits the distances and times a little better than the, than the Salisbury Cove uh, model. Uh, but but I'm, uh, David Quinn is a great scholar, and I treat, hold him with respect. I would say I think that he was, that uh, Champlain was on the island at least three times. Uh, and had a better sense of the place, saw more of it than, uh, than, we, than we thought as we begin to study the timing of those, it was those, oh, those, uh, those three uh, voyages that I was alluding to uh, before. Do you wanna, do you wanna say any, uh, something else about that? It's my, my old ears are not up to the. Yes. Yep. Yep. No, I think there's no question. But he was he was ferreting along that coast. Uh, but I think there are other there are other indications in in the the events that follow the grounding and the repair of that patache uh, that show a proximity to to Soames Sound. Uh, and uh, perhaps also to the harbors that are now northeast and southwest. So, yeah. Yes. They were both, and it varied by these groups. There was a, there were, a, a, there was a fourth population, which began to grow at the same time. The critical moments for the growth of these, of these French populations were the, with the year from the years from. 1633 to 1635. That was the inflection point for all of them. And the fourth was on the fishing coast. And it was in that period that we begin to get permanent settlement, permanent French settlement along the fishing coast, first at a place called Miscou Island. And that was a fishing culture. But the culture of Acadia was very much of a farming culture, forming around those, that diking system that was brought from central France. Much of my last chapter is about where they came from. And they brought in a very distinctive form of agriculture there, which also carried with it a, a, an idea of local assemblies that was unique to that part of New France. And then Quebec had a mixed system. Uh, it was farming. There was some fishing, not a lot. 
uh, but it was mostly farming and extractive industry. It was the fur trade and that sort of thing. Yes. I think uh, the short answer to that question is, first of all, I, I, I think it's just an, an extraordinary story and I think unique in the history of colonization. It wasn't common to other French colonizers. Cartier behaved very differently. And there were some uh, Spanish and English who approached something like that, but this was something special. And how he did it, first of all, he didn't do it alone. And there were circles of humanists. He was moving in several circles, one of them around the king, others in other parts of France, but then there were some of the humanists who came with him. There would be people like Marc Lescarbeau in Nova Scotia, who was, uh, let's say in Port Royal, who's very much a part of this, even though they fell out a little bit later over other things. <coughs> and so he was, he was choosing his subordinates in that way. And when he wasn't there, things rapidly fell apart, at least in Port in some, in the early parts of it. And we have the letters flowing back from the Jesuits and the Recollets who describe how that happened. But then by the end of it, after 1635, he'd succeeded in institutionalizing it. And without going into great detail, there were some of these truchements. Nicolette is one of the central figures in this story. Uh, not only in anchoring all of this, but extending its reach. The settlement of Trois Rivières, founded in 1634, uh, institutionalizes it in a local culture. And that became, that was the frontier at that time. And it spread outward from, from that. So it wasn't a solitary act. I don't mean to suggest that. Um, David Hackett-Fisher, thank you so much for a marvelous and engaging <laughs> evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the time. I, no, no, no. It always gets away from me. My, my wife says I come with an all switch, but she's the only one who knows where it is. <laughs> I, I think you have assured that there will be all of us in line for the book. Uh, and I, 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 I suspect that we have questions that we will be pursuing with you for some time. Thank you so much. Well, I just say one of the, my email address is, uh, is dhfisher at comcast.net. If you want to pursue any of these issues, uh, we, we could have a continued exchange of views on Salisbury Cove uh, <laughs> or uh, anything else that comes to mind. I would really like to hear from you. Uh, you know this ground, and let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.